You're listening to the Kiwi Tripsters Travel Podcast. Brought to you by Abercrombie and Kent, pioneering experiential luxury travel since 1962. Buckle up and take off every fortnight to spectacular destinations as we share the inside word on all things travel. Whether you're into luxury travel or tripping on a budget, whether it's river cruising or foodie trips, we've got you covered with top tips and tricks so you can have an awesome travel experience. Tune in with Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio. And be sure to like and share this episode so everyone can get a taste of all things travel and now on to the show with your host from Christchurch New Zealand Mike Yardley and Chris Lynch G'day there and thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Kiwi Tripsters Hot Off The Press. Great to be back with you and we're going to kick off with what I think is one of New Zealand's greatest experiences, the sort of thing you must do at least once in your life, the Grand Traverse. Now Chris Lynch has just done this over the summer. What is the Grand Traverse, Chris? The Grand Traverse is a very fancy word or words, if you like, for an absolutely out-of-this-world experience on a flight, Air Safari's flight. This is an airline company that's based in Lake Tikapo, and you get to go over some of New Zealand's most majestic, magical glaciers and the Southern Alps and see all there is to see. And I know it's... It's something that I think everybody should do, as you say, because, you know, you look at the postcards, you see lovely images occasionally of Mount Cook and and the glaciers. It's not until you're on that plane where you can see so much. In Mm. fact, the plane is built in such a way that... uh, you have a window seat, regardless of where you are, and you can just see the most spectacular images of New Zealand. You've done it as well, haven't you? I did it uh, in winter about uh, three years ago, absolutely. They've been running about 45 years here, Safari, so they're a very plucky family uh, business. And the, I think the trip from memory, Chris, is about one hour, isn't it? Is it about yeah, an hour? it's about that. Yeah. yeah. I was lucky enough. I think we were we were in the air slightly um, more than that. Yeah. And the reason being was it was a bit of an overcast day. So once again, they're very good. You can either, um, if it's an overcast, you can reschedule. But yes. if you can't and we couldn't, we, we took our chances. Yeah. And still, even though it was overcast and there was cloud that was touching some of the mountains, my, oh my, it was still spectacular from seeing, you know, the likes of the Tasman Glacier um, to uh, the tips of Mount Cook. We could still see a lot. Yeah. And for me, it was a life-changing experience. I know it was for you as well. And I thought to myself a couple of days later when I saw some images of it on a fine day. Yeah. And I thought, my goodness, for me, it was fabulous, overcast. You have done it when there's no clouds. Mm. I can't imagine how amazing that must be. Well, I was looking at some of your pictures and the thing which I think is really intriguing um, and probably not what a lot of people can appreciate is the fact that, I mean, I did it in the peak of winter, right? So there was a hell of a lot of snow. But even in the peak of summer, when you did it, uh, those higher mountains, and obviously that includes Mount Cook, mm. so much snow, so much ice. I mean, those yeah. glaciers are just like slithering tongues of ice, really, aren't they? They are. And when you look at them, you almost feel like they do have a life of their own. Totally. You, you feel like they're living, sort of Beasts. breathing souls. And yeah. I think that's because they're so majestic yeah. and, and something that you won't see unless you are getting a bird's eye view. But yeah. um, And we were lucky enough to, we got quite close to the summit of Mount Cook. Right. And it was interesting because, the, you know, there was no cloud. Yeah. All of a sudden, Mount Cook appeared. We thought, what? It's just there. Yeah. Um, there is a sense that, you know, the, the plane... You feel like the planes are going. When I was looking at my video footage, you feel like the planes are going quite close to the to the mountains. They probably are. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's probably more mind over matter. But you always feel safe. You always feel safe. Yes, um, I was surprised how close you do get to the rock face. You know, close to the summit of Mount Cook, to the point where I felt like if I could put my hand through the window, I could virtually touch the mountain. It felt that close. It may have been an optical illusion. But um, the other thing which I recall, I don't know if you experienced any of this, Chris, is when we first um, had left Tekapo, flew over the lake, and I think you then go up the the Godly Valley from memory, and then sort of turn left to head up into the Southern Alps, there was this big southwest updraft of air. So while the plane was wending its way through the peaks of the Southern Alps, it was like 
it felt like being in a tumble dryer. Like the plane was being jostled around by the wind. Now that's, and I found that a bit disconcerting. Well, it's interesting you say that because when we took off from Lake Tikapo the, and we were um, flying over the lake, that's when I felt the air pockets and it was right. a bit bumpy. I thought, oh, this yeah. is a bit yeah. un- unnerving. But ironically, once we got into the glacier country, mm-hmm. completely still, yeah. completely fine. And yeah. uh, I was, uh, my friend and I were both uh, filming it. We both were using stabilizers and gimbals, mm-hmm. which it basically really does stabilize your camera so you can film things. And even if the plane bumps, you don't notice it. Yeah. But the weird thing was when you're using stabilizers and the plane does a, um, a sharp bank or, or a turn, the stabilizer gets confused and doesn't know what to do. To, is trying to always keep the picture balanced. Yeah. So my camera starts going almost upside down. Yeah. But then when you look at your footage back, you don't see that because it's still trying to capture um, the mountain straight. So the camera's going almost up, you know, turning around. <laughs> and it's like, oh, no, you don't need to do that. And on the footage, you don't recognize that because wow. it's trying to keep the, the footage stable. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> fan- that's fantastic. The other amazing thing is you will see the difference in the glaciers, like between Tasman Glacier, which uh, is New Zealand's longest glacier, mm. and that is like the big slithering tongue that ends up in, is it Tasman Lake, they call it? Yes. Which then... has s- almost small icebergs in it too. It does, mm. yes, because they carve off at the end of the glacier, don't they, into the lake. Yeah. And then all of that ends up in Lake Pukaki, which gives the likes of Lake Pukaki and Tekapo that amazing luminescent turquoise sort of mm. glow. It's all of that um, gl- glacial salt or, or silt in the water. Um, but compared to Tasman Glacier, which is just like this big river of ice, I always find it amazing when you get to the top of the Southern Alps heading towards the West Coast and you see Franz Joseph Glacier and it's just like this downhill slalom into the yeah. sea, isn't it? Yeah. It is so close to the Tasman Sea. Yeah. I was trying to work out what 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 was which at one stage. Yeah. But it's, um, it, yeah. it is. It's incredible. It's something that I think everybody should do. Um, obviously, they mainly cater for the tourism market. Yeah. Um, but I think that should change. I think this is something that many New Zealanders should try and do yeah. once, don't you? It's a patriotic calling, Chris, I think so. I th- well said. Yes. Look at your own backyard first before you go overseas. <laughs> this is this is it. Listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> so Air Safaris is how you can do it. Air Safaris in Lake Tekapo. Uh, it's absolutely a must do. Okay, let's take you to Lithuania now and the capital city of Vilnius. Is it an attractive place? It looks pretty nice on the old Google image search, Mike. Well, Vilnius is, um, yeah, I was expecting it to be pretty oppressive, a sort of a grey urban fabric, but the old town's architectural splendour is uh, rock your socks off territory, Yeah. Um, but it does have a really blood-stained backstory, and about half of the city centre was destroyed in World War II. The restoration has been incredible, and there's sort of a sense of fairy tale to a lot of the old town sort of tapestry now, so many different styles. You've got Gothic and Renaissance and big showy Baroque confections. Instabate central uh, old town Vilnius, although there are plenty of grisly reminders of Nazi and mm. Soviet occupation. Like the chilly, uh, or the chilling rather, KGB museum. Yes, the Atmos at the KGB museum is stone cold, even haunted. It was an old gymnasium which became the headquarters of the Gestapo first, and then the Soviet secret police. And the KGB ruled the roost for nearly 50 years. Um, And it does feel sort of uh, stuck in time because the cells are exactly how the KGB left them when the KGB fled Lithuania in 1991. And you can walk through the execution and the torture chambers Mm. in the basement. That's pretty sobering stuff. There were over a 1,000 locals executed in this building. Um, and a lot of troublemakers in the eyes of the KGB were then also shipped off to Siberia. And as I was being taken through the KGB museum, I had this lovely guide, and she said that she discovered, much to her horror, that her neighbour was a KGB officer. Um, And this was shortly after Lithuania uh, gained its freedom from the Soviet Union. And he had, you know, executed untold locals. Wow. And she had lived next to him for decades. Um, it was a great gardener, always very friendly. And then she discovered the the chilling truth as to what he actually did. Makes you wonder whether it's worth knowing what he did in the first place or well, just, you know. It. Yeah. You know, 
in, look, you need to give us something to lift your mood, our mood, because you're always uh, doing these museums of torture and et cetera. All and so forth. gruesome. Yeah. Well, there's a gallery actually within the KGB Museum, which is so uplifting. And it illustrates what was called the Baltic Way, which is probably one of the most famous mass demonstrations from the 20th century. So this is where two million people linked hands 30 years ago along the major highways of the Baltic states, including Lithuania, to demand independence and freedom. And this human chain, I mean, it it sort of covered the same distance as, say, from Whangarei to Wellington. Um, And a couple of years after they did this mass demonstration, their wish was granted. So the photographic exhibition inside the KGB Museum of the Baltic Way is absolutely superb. But yeah, the reminders of war are never far from view. And just out of town, uh, I was heading to a place called Trakai, and we passed Panarai Forest, which was the scene of unimaginable horror that was in this forest that the Nazis exterminated 100,000 locals, which is just eye-popping. It is hard to imagine. It's, yeah, that's a, it's hard to fathom, isn't it? It is. 100,000. Yeah, mainly Jews, yeah. Okay, um, we need to talk about the food because I'm feeling a bit hungry, actually. Um, I, I can't think of what the, their food style would be like. Yeah, it's well, a sort of pastries and things. Very much so. They're very proud of their savoury pastries. Um, one in particular called kibbenai, which is kind of similar to a Cornish pasty. Uh, very flaky, soft pastry, and it's stuffed with potato and mincemeat. The, the national dish in Lithuania, which I binged on, are zeppelins. And these are like dumplings, very delectable dumplings made from grated and riced potatoes and they're stuffed with ground meat or dry Mm. curd cheese and mushrooms. They're really delish. And they're so named because their shape uh, resembles a Zeppelin airship. And um, also, uh, while I was in Vilnius, the capital, um, a lot of people said to me, you've got to try cold beetroot soup and potato sausages, which apparently is a staple (laughs) <laughs> in Vilnius. And, and did you try it? Well, I did, but I wouldn't be gagging to go back again for that. Um, a cold sausage. I know. Cold beetroot soup and potato sausage. Okay. Yeah, but, um, I mean, it very much speaks to their deprivation in wartime. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, not not the tastiest thing. By the way, I mentioned trakai, um, and trakai is like dipping into a storybook because it's only about 30 minutes from downtown Vilnius, but it's – um, just beautiful, all lakes and forests, and this castle called Trakai Island Castle seemingly floats on the water, um, and it's very much the cradle of Lithuania's sense of nationhood. Mm. Uh, the castle is about six hundred years old. It's been fully restored. It's all crimson-coloured brick, and it makes for a really nice jaunt from. Uh, central Vilnius. I love hearing about some of these stories because after I've spoken to you, I always do a bit of a Google search yes. and think, I need to go there. Yeah. I need to go there. Do you like mead? The drink mead? No, I've never heard of it. <laughs> well, I was fascinated when I was in Lithuania. Um, they have a love affair with this ancient drink. I think mead actually features in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Um, okay. And you'll see it on sale everywhere. Mead. They've actually got the patent on the recipe for this drink, mead, which apparently dates back to India 6,000 years ago. But the Lithuanian mead company has the patent on the recipe. So it's a really big business. (laughs) It's basically like fermented honey and water. Oh. I know. Um, is, is it, does it taste nice or is it sweet or bitter? Well, they, they try and sweeten it up with uh, like juniper berries and lime flowers and they age it for, for about 18 months. But yeah, an acquired taste once again, a bit like the potato sausages and cold <laughs> beetroot soup. Um, <laughs> but you can even enjoy just a wee taste of tipple at Vilnius Airport. Okay, I'll make a go of it. Listen, before we finish, we'll take you to Cambridge in the UK, but just ahead, the scenic drives of Whangarei. Stay tuned. Kiwi Tripsters will be right back after this break. 
An Abercrombie and Kent luxury safari is quite simply the greatest outdoor adventure holiday you will ever have. Choose your own adventure in South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya and many other countries on a continent no one knows like Abercrombie and Kent. The adventure starts here. AbercrombieKent.co.nz you're with Kiwi Tripsters, and if you're road tripping this summer in New Zealand, Mike, you highly recommend the scenic drive from Whangarei. Uh, is the Tutukaka Loop Drive, that's pretty busy at uh, this time of the year, isn't it? It's probably the most trafficked out of all of the scenic drive options from Whangarei. Uh, whenever I head up to Northland, it always feels like a glorified overseas trip compared to the South Island because... All of that subtropical foliage in Northland, it's just so positively South Pacific. Yeah. But um, yeah, that two-hour Tutukaka Coast Loop Drive is so photogenic. And I love how the string of villages along the coast are so blissed out. You know, mm. they're, they're, they've, got, they've got the state of seclusion and relaxation, lots of creative types there, probably a bit of dope smoking, <laughs> and uh, convivial pubs galore. But of course, the popularity of this route might also have something to do with the fact that people will go to Tutukaka um, to check out the Poor Knights Islands. Very lush around the area, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, now, if you do go to Tutukaka to go to the Poor Knights, you may want to be going diving. I'm not a diver. I mm. will do, sca- um, I was going to say scaffolding. I do do <laughs> snorkeling. I, actually, I haven't done scaffolding, but I have done snorkeling, but I, I, I'm i just too much of a sock for diving. Um mm. Too out, too out of my depth, excuse the pun. Well, that's it. Yeah. yeah just, but what yeah. you can do, if you do want to uh, take a day trip out to the Poor Knights Islands to see people dive, you can join a lot of those, you know, sightseeing um, uh, trips out from Tutukaka. Um, beautiful scenery. I did go to Schnapper Rock, which is sort of like this beacon of Tutukaka hospitality. It's sort of got like the thatched South Pacific style roof and whatnot. Very cool. It's also got the very tall uh, kauri, hasn't it? Did you find that easy to find? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, when you think of uh, famous kauri, you'll probably think of Tane Mahuta further up north. But mm. um, um, he has a brother or sister. I'm not quite sure of the gender, Tane Moana. Probably a sister by the sounds of Moana. Um, and Tane Moana is the largest Kauri survivor on Northland's east coast. Tane Mahuta is more in, you know, sort of Hokianga area. Yeah. But, um, yeah, she's 30 metres tall, uh, just under 200 years old. She's got a stunning crown. And apparently previous generations of locals, they used to gather en masse under Tane Mo- Moana on Christmas Day for a picnic. But even though it's quite a slog to get an audience with Moana, um, she's sort of tucked away in a forest and it's a four-hour return walk to see her. Um, the track is actually quite a gentle walk and, mm. you you know, you'll see lots of lovely native bush uh, to and fro from Tana Moana. It is, it's beautiful around there, really. Yeah. It's very green, very lush. Uh, what else did you like about this loop? Well, I As top- in the drive, that is. Yeah, the Tutukaka Scenic Loop. Um, I topped off my ride around there by taking in some of the northern beaches, so north of Tutukaka, um, and Whale Bay would be my favourite. It is f- thickly fringed in Pahutakawa, and uh, the sweep of the bay is very sort of crescent-shaped. So it's just beautiful and so unpeopled. And I love how you access the beach by walking through a, um, a grove of ancient Peruri trees. But, um, yeah, they've just got such an abundance of beautiful, pristine beaches on Northland's east coast, which I think are underrated and very impressive. But that's probably their charm in a way, underrated, yeah. because uh, it's never too busy. No, it's not Coromandel, you know. Well, it's, yeah. Exactly, and that's yeah. what I like about it. Uh, what about the Whangare Head Road? Yeah, this is definitely worth a drive. So you strike out from Onorahi along the peninsula's uh, road all the way. It's quite a pencil-thin road, so be careful. But all the way... Um, around that drive, you'll just get the most magnificent coastal views. It's sort of like a miniature version of the Tutukaka coast. Very scenic, great walks, so many little pocket bays, one after another like Munro, McLeod, McGregor's and Mackenzie Bay. And once again, they're all framed with Pahutukawa trees leaning over the shoreline. Which makes great Instagram photos. Oh, absolutely. What was your favourite walking track? Well, I absolutely love the look of Mount Manaya and it sort of 
reminds me a bit of Rarotonga or Tahiti. It's got those lovely sort of fang-like peaks jutting out from its summit. And um, you can do the walk to the summit, which is a bit of a slog. It's a thousand steps up, but it is manageable. You've got lots of lovely lush native forest. And once you get to the top, those 360 views are mm. sizzling. And at the base of Manaya, Mount Manaya, they've got this fantastic memorial which, uh, which pays tribute to the district's early European settlers who are all Scottish Highlanders, um, hence the name of those bays, Munro, MacLeod, McGregor's, Mackenzie. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it all sort of weaves it together. Gosh, from European names. Now, Waipu is still a Scottish hotbed, right? Yeah, it is. Right across the harbour and just south of Marsden Point. Um, you can follow the sprawling arc of Bream Bay uh, to Waipu. And if you pop into Waipu, the museum there does a great job of showcasing the migration of the town's original 900 settlers via Nova Scotia. Um, and I love the massive murals at Waipu Cove, which celebrate the great Pacific migration mm. and then the great migration of the Scots. Now, we've been giving away, uh, and we're giving you rather the chance to win with Lonely Planets, the world's number one travel guidebook. And we've got a winner to announce from our Facebook page, Mike. Yes, uh, congratulations to Andrew Meadows. Andrew Meadows from Facebook, you are the latest winner. Well done, mate. We'll be in touch with you shortly and we'll get that Lonely Planet guidebook out your way. And don't forget, you can be into win as well uh, if you like our Facebook page or rate our podcast on iTunes. Let's head to the UK. And is Cambridge all about the university? Mike, or is it a bit bigger than that? Well, Chris, like Oxford, this most English of cities is definitely anchored by its university. It's like a sprawling scholarly mecca. And this is the second oldest university in the English-speaking world. The backstory to it is quite interesting because it was founded by a group of Oxford scholars. That had a tiff with the local townsfolk in Oxford, so they upped sticks and established this rival university. And um, their alumni roster is second to none in terms of who has gone through their hallowed halls. You know, it's everyone from mm. Charles Darwin to Isaac Newton. And architecturally, yeah, Cambridge is very attractive. What are some of the standout bits that you like the most? Well, I loved cruising around the cobbled lanes and watching students on bikes disappear behind these ancient oak doors and medieval gates. There's a real sense of mystery to a, uh, a lot of parts of the city. Mm. And people go gaga over the sublime architecture of King's College and King's College Chapel, which is the Cambridge poster child. I really liked Trinity College, which Henry VIII founded. And, um, if you've seen Chariots of Fire, you will recognise it because the central square of Trinity College, which is called the Great Court, uh, was used in uh, Chariots of Fire quite a lot. Christopher Wren added the library, which looks like a Harry Potter movie set. <laughs> and there's all sorts of really cool relics uh, in the library, like Christopher Wren's walking stick and, um, and all sorts of other good stuff as well. Why am I getting uh, Labyrinth is coming into my head? I feel yeah. like it's almost a yeah, labyrinth of goodness. Yeah, um, Any quirky sites, uh, any stakeouts you'd recommend? Yeah, well, it's a city not short on curious scientific contraptions. And mm. a case in point is the Queen's College Moon Dial. Now, this thing is 300 years old. It's painted on the side of a building, and it's designed to read the shadow cast by the light of the moon. I mean, a lot of people have sundials, right? This is a moon dial. Um, and you can apply all sorts of mathematical calculations to it. Um, but there's heaps of curios in Cambridge like that. And if you do a walking tour, you know, with a local guide, yeah, they'll uh, uncover all sorts of secrets uh, to Cambridge for you. Okay. Um, Cambridge, it is also the home, sort of similar to Christchurch in some respects, of punting. Well, I'm sure that Christchurch, New Zealand, yeah, definitely uh, took its cue from some of the traditions in Cambridge. Uh, so, yes, uh, the gentle Edwardian pursuit of punting, it began on the Thames, but the love affair has never ebbed in Cambridge. It is a boom business. There are more punts on their river, the River Cam today, than anywhere else in the world. And the oldest operator uh, is called Scudamore's Punting 
Company. Their punts accrued largely by preppy undergraduates earning a bit of coin, and they'll happily share heaps of their own insights and experiences of real Cambridge life as, as you cruise along the River Cam. Any um, museums worthy of a bit of a nosy? Well, you know I'm a museum freak. I, I'm getting, I know, that's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would say put the Polar Museum at the top of your list. Uh, this will really resonate with Kiwis because it extensively focuses on the ill-fated expedition of Captain Scott. So you can see and read the heart-tugging last letters written by Scott and his team to loved ones. And among the exhibits is Captain Oates's sleeping bag, slit wide open so he could manoeuvre his frostbitten feet. And another famous figure whose legacy abounds all over town is Charles Darwin. So you can follow the Darwin Trail from his time at King's College to the various collections of rocks and plants he gathered um, on his groundbreaking expeditions on HMS Beagle. Did you check out the Eagle? I loved this old-time hangout, the Eagle. Uh, they mix frothy ales with scientific tales at the Eagle. <laughs> and this frothy ale. Frothy ales, indeed. They, and they can be a bit warm as well. But anyway, this <laughs> pub is 700 years old, and um, it's actually owned by Corpus Christi College. The favoured local... Uh, for scientific scholars, this pub is. It was here that um, in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick announced to fellow pub patrons that they had discovered the secret of life, or DNA, as we know it today. Okay. Now, what about Britain's best buns? Well, I'm always looking for a good B-U-N-S. bun. B-U-N-S. Yes. If you're a fan of the Chelsea bun... Yes, I am. Uh, you can take tea and buns at Fitzbillies. Now, this is a Cambridge institution, this place. Uh, they have produced their famed sticky Chelsea buns on site for 85 years. Mm. And they are regularly crowned as producing Britain's best Chelsea buns. A frothy ale and a Chelsea bun is exactly what, what you need. more could you want in life? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Kiwi Tripsters. We'll have a fresh episode for you in about two weeks' time. Yes, and Chris is just off to the GC, the Yay! Gold Coast of Australia, so we'll uh, make sure he does every possible thrill ride along the Gold Coast. Oh, I will be. No museums there. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, that's true. <laughs> and uh, we'll get him to rate the theme parks and the best rides. See you soon. And that's a wrap for this episode of Kiwi Tripsters. Liked what you listened to? Then join us for our next episode of Kiwi Tripsters, where we bring you more travel inspiration, giveaways, and insider knowledge with expert guests on the show. Connect with us on Facebook and Instagram, and visit us on kiwitripsters.co.nz. But most importantly, subscribe and comment on Apple Podcasts, and tell us what you think of our show. Till next time, safe travels. Safe travels.